Welcome back to this uh, new lecture of Robotics 2. This is the first of the final uh, set of lecture, which is devoted to a, a topic which has been for a while a research topic in our department, in our robotics group. So today we will uh, speak about uh, detection of faults in robotic systems. Faults, so uh, malfunctioning of components uh, in the structure. Uh, we will focus mainly on uh, actuator faults, so on a situation where uh, the robot actuators are not delivering the expected torque that we are commanding to them. And there is no way to uh, measure this directly, because we send a command to the actuators and we expect that the actuator uh, respond in a correct way. This is one possi possible uh, situation of uh, faults, uh, we will treat the problem. For doing this, we, I will introduce first some general concept on fault diagnosis for dynamic systems, and then uh, we will see uh, what is the result that we obtain uh, for uh, robot actuator faults. At the end of this lecture, I will try to present a, a few extensions of the same method. So, uh, detection and isolation of robot actuators is our uh, first uh, our topic today. So, first of all, uh, what is fault diagnosis? So, the system, the dynamic system, uh, are possibly non-linear, like in the robot case, uh, may be subject to uh, malfunction. So deviation of the behavior, of the expected behavior, with respect to the planet one, because of some malfunctioning of components. And we uh, formulate a, seri a series of possible problems within this uh, context. So we would like to understand if something is going wrong, what is going wrong, why is going wrong, and what to do in response to that. Essentially, fault detection is uh, recognizing if uh, a system, a general system, typically we are interested in control systems, so systems that are subject to automatic control, uh, see, uh, if some malfunction is due to uh, the fact that a component is not working properly. We call this a fault, uh, so an un improper behavior of uh, some components. Typically, this may be physical components, but in fact, it can have also software faults, so of a function which reveals only under certain conditions. We will mainly be interested, however, in uh, faults due to uh, component. Uh, isolation, uh, okay, you can detect that something is going wrong, uh, and you may have a list of potential faults that may occur on your system, this list may be very large. Indeed, if the system is complex, you may have also a very, uh, very long list of uh, potential faults that can occur uh, alone or in combination with other possible faults. So, fault isolation uh, is the process, is the problem, and then there are techniques for doing this, uh, that can discriminate which of a fixed, though large class of um, potential fault has occurred. So you have to distinguish it if uh, a generic fault has occurred with respect to any other faults, uh, and also to distinguish that uh, the fact that uh, a fault has occurred and not just a temporary disturbance. So this is Another problem, because disturbances act on our system and uh, all the time, in a sense, or in some phases of its operation. So, uh, if the disturbance uh, is the cause of our deviation from our expected behavior, then uh, indeed we don't have to intervene at the level of uh, uh, configuration in order to accommodate the occurrence of a fault. We should only design a better control law that tolerates uh, disturbances. 
So discriminating not only which fault is occurring among a set, but also if a fault or a disturbance has occurred is very important. And if we are able to do this, we say that we are able to achieve fault isolation and not just detection, so not just realizing that something is going wrong. Uh, indeed, there's one more step. Uh, these problems and their solution, in fact, are in, in cascade, in a sense, fault identification, which means that uh, if I have understood, for instance, in our case, that the actuator of joint 3 is not working properly, so I have detected a malfunction and also isolate which of the N robot actuator is not working properly, then uh, I may wish to understand what type of problem is going on there. And we will see that we can list a number of situations where the actuator are not working properly. So we would like to determine what is the time profile or the type of class. If it's a severe uh, fault, it's a temporary fault, is uh, uh, concurrent with other faults, and all these type of things uh, about the faults. When we have a, a time profile of the evolution of the, the fault, uh, then we can classify it and we call this process fault identification. Finally, accommodation is another problem, so fault accommodation. Uh, if you have done all the things that uh, I just spoke about, so detection, isolation, identification, or even just one of them, the detection, the, 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 the uh, first uh, stage of this process, uh, then you may wish to change something. Uh, since we are talking about control of the dynamic system, uh, what you can do, you, you can modify your control law so that the effects that you detected and possibly isolated and also possibly also identified uh, of the faults uh, are reduced, uh, reduce their effect on the performance of the system. Uh, so, uh, in particular, we are we will be interested in uh, a special problem in fault diagnosis, which is the so-called FDI solution which means uh, fault detection and isolation at the same time. So in, in, in our um, problem that we will consider uh, in a moment, uh, we are not just interested in detecting that uh, uh, one of the actuators is not working, but automatically we would like to know which one, because for a robot an actuator not working probably means that one of the degrees of freedom is not behaving as desired. And for instance, if we, have a re if we have a redundant system, then we may decide to switch off that joint, and then we have to reconfigure our controller in such a way that the remaining joint uh, maybe are still sufficient to do the task, but we are reallocating uh, things. So uh, isolation is very important, not only detection in our case, although detection uh, is uh, per se uh, already an interesting problem. And we will see this uh, in a, uh, when we will consider in the le next lecture uh, the co possible collision occurring between the robot and, and the environment as a class of special faults. But let's go back to the FDI solution. So how do we uh, approach the simultaneous detection and isolation? But simil uh, the so-called uh, well, model-based or signal-based method uh, requires the generation, the, the design of a, a residual generator. So uh, another dynamic system in general, which is auxiliary, which is not needed for controlling the system, but for monitoring the events uh, that we label as fault. Uh, this uh, dynamic system and the output of this dynamic system, which is feed by, by all possible measurement that we can do on the system and if we are following a model-based approach also by all the models that we have available about our system, in particular our robot. So this output is sensitive to the presence of a specific fault in the sense that the output is 
let's say, zero when the fault is not there, and is excited as soon as the fault appears. And we have a residual generator for a single fault, which means that if other faults or disturbance, any combination of everything else but the fault for which we have designed the residual generator occur, then the output will remain to zero. Uh, if the, the specific fault, and if and only if, I would say, the specific fault uh, is present, then the output goes out of zero, so that we can say that we have detected and isolated that particular fault out of uh, a list of potential ones. In, in addition, we would like that this uh, generator uh, can be reused if the fault occurs and then uh, as a termination, so this is a temporary fault, we would like that our generator uh, returns to the uh, still state so that we can say after a while that there was a disturbance, the, sorry, there was a fault, but now this fault has gone. So the output should converge asymptotically to zero as soon as the fault vanishes, and this is a kind of stability or asymptotic stability property for this residual generator. <coughs> now, if we consider more faults, let's say 10 possible faults, then you can design a residual generator for each of them, but in fact you have to make a, a design which is uh, integrated, so you generate a vector of residual, as many components as the number of faults that you would like to uh, detect and isolate, and each uh, component of this output vector of, uh, of this uh, uh, residual generator uh, will depend on one and only one uh, fault so you have a decoupling in a sense. So when fault Fi is present, then only the component Ri will be changed as output. Uh, and this is true for all the considered faults. In this case, you have uh, a solution to the detection and isolation problem simultaneously. And of course, if you look at this uh, residuals uh, component, uh, by looking their, their time profile, you may also infer some concept about uh, the behavior of the faults, so uh, also the identification problem could be uh, attacked in, in the same way. Now, um, those schemes, at least the most efficient one, are typically model-based, so we use a nominal model, dynamic model of the system, that we are monitoring and for which we would like to uh, design a diagnosis, a fault diagnosis system. So nominal means that we know how the uh, system behaves when there are no disturbances and no faults. Okay, so this is a, a strong information that we assume to have and sometimes we don't have a model so we have to resort to signal-based uh, fault diagnosis um, methods in particular uh, that are able to do uh, detection and isolation at the same time. Uh, last uh, few words on, 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 on terminology and on definition, uh, fault tolerant control. So as we said, uh, we are interested in detecting faults for systems that we, are, we have under control, in our case the robot system, and we would like to make something, uh, some, uh, execute some task with our uh, robot, and we are controlling it uh, for this purpose. Now, all of a sudden, some fault occurs, we may uh, detect the fault, uh, a faulty situation, we may isolate which fault is occurring, eventually uh, also identifying the class and type, the, se the severity of the fault, and so on. Now, we would like to make something at the level of control so that we can tolerate the presence of this fault. Now, there are two main broad approaches to fault tolerant control. The first one is passive. So this means that we design uh, from scratch the control law, taking into account the possibility of having faults. Uh, 
so that uh, when these faults really occur, then the control law is automatically uh, pro providing um, a response to it without switching or changing configuration or scheme. So uh, this is uh, it's the highest level of robustness. Uh, we haven't covered robust control for uh, trajectory tracking in robots, but I mentioned in the general presentation introduction on control that robustness, robust control means that we take into account the uncertainty and we have some uh, bounds on the uncertainty. Uh, if we have also uh, a definition of faults and the possibility of detecting and uh, structuring our controller, then this is a next level of robustness and then we will have a fault tolerant control without design, without changing any, any uh, component. Uh, more likely is that we go active, especially if the faults may have uh, not a moderate or limited effect on the performance of our system. Active means that after we have, so, uh, we have detected the fault and we have isolated typically, then we switch uh, the control configuration to a, a new one which is adapted to the new situation and will guarantee a level of performance, total performance or uh, reduced performance, but with some guarantee of uh, limited reduction for the faulted system. And we may have several uh, alternative uh, reconfiguration depending on the fault, depending on the severity of the faults, and so on and so on. And you can imagine that this is a more flexible way of handling things. You may also combine active and pass passive uh, scheme in the sense that you reconfigure your control scheme once you have isolated the fault and within the reconfiguration you are tolerant uh, to a large variation of this particular fault. So let's uh, see a very general architecture. Uh, I'm taking this slide uh, from a, a research paper. Uh, you will find all the bibliographic references at the end. Uh, this is uh, uh, from a paper by Thomas Parisini, who's a professor uh, in uh, uh, Trieste, um, part-time. So this is a possible uh, typical FDI architecture. So we have uh, a model-based approach and we have a set of estimators. Let's denote the number n plus 1, why n? Because we have n faults uh, being considered. And we have uh, one estimator which is uh, intended for detection. So one of these estimators will detect the presence of any faulty condition among those that we uh, have in mind. And then there will be an estimator which proceeds for uh, performing isolation once we have, and they start when we have detected the faulty condition. So in the block diagram on the bottom part you will see a generic nonlinear plant. This may be also our robot uh, with some command U and some state X. Uh, we will see that we assume a full state measurement. In general, you may have only a reduced information about the state of the plant, but let's consider the uh, simpler case. So we know everything about the state. The state is used for the feedback controller, for instance, a, a PID control or a feedback linearization controller together with some reference input. And this is the uh, dynamic system that we have in mind under consideration. We design a, a, a good controller, everything works fine until something uh, goes uh, differently from what expected because uh, we have to detect that a fault has, in fact, occur. So uh, you see that the fault detection and approximation estimator, so this uh, also includes some uh, tolerance to uh, small uncertainty. So, but this is uh, um, generating um, some signals and in fact, based on those, these signals, we have a scheme that decides whether uh, the, the fault is present and so we are detecting or uh, otherwise this is just a disturbance 
uh, or uh, and then we can continue to uh, work as before. Um, if we detect it, so an alarm uh, starts, and this alarm activates also a bank of uh, isolating estimators of the faults. I would say one component for each one uh, residual generator for each uh, fault that we like to isolate. This bank process the information coming from the plant, so both the inputs and the measurement of the state, and uses possibly also model of the nonlinear plant under the feedback controller. And uh, sometimes uh, this output will be processed by uh, an isolation, isolation scheme, and then uh, we decide that the fault has been isolated and possibly also identified. So, for instance, uh, let's consider um, a generic example. Before uh, doing this, there are many fault types that we can consider. Um, depending on, of course, we are not now referring to the devices. Eh? We will see, we will consider in this lecture um, actuators that may fail, and later on a special class of sensor as well. But in any case, so the type of faults that uh, a device undergoes may be instantaneous or abrupt. So all of a sudden, and everything was working properly, and all of a sudden uh, the fault appears. Or maybe incipient, in the sense that there are some traces, some signature of the, of the um, underlying faults that can be detected in uh, the monitoring signal so even uh, slightly before then the actual fault will occur. Other terminology are intermittent faults that they appear and disappear and, and several times possibly. Of course, also this is a, uh, an unfortunate uh, situation that should be uh, you should react to this. And then also concurrency is very important. So you may assume that if you're lucky, you have only one fault at a time. Sometimes a fault generates a second fault, so we have concurrency as well. And this is, uh, we will see that uh, if you make uh, this relatively strong assumption that you don't have concurrent faults, so that only one uh, fault can occur at a the time, then uh, there are methodologies that are uh, enables to do detection and isolation uh, in relaxed conditions. Now, another important aspect uh, is the setting of threshold. In the way I have uh, presented the uh, detection problem, but also the isolation problem, I'm saying uh, that we generate with a residual generator a signal which is zero, and then when it's non-zero, something uh, is being detected or isolated. Of course, zero non-zero is uh, very difficult to discriminate, and typically you introduce some threshold. So you say that uh, you consider the output to be zero below a certain small threshold. When it exceeds the threshold, then you detect. And this is, a, um, uh, I would say, a, an easy way to handle also the pres presence of noises in your, uh, in your measurement, which are typically disturbances, so you should not react to that. Uh, the presence of small uncertainty uh, and to make the whole detection more robust. Of course, if you take a, a, a threshold which is too large, uh, you may have uh, uh, false uh, negative in the sense that you don't see that the fault is happening, but in fact the fault is there. Uh, if you take a threshold too small, then you may have some uh, false positive in the sense that uh, the alarm uh, starts uh, because your residual output is uh, overcoming this small threshold, but in fact uh, it is coming back very soon because this was only effect of noise or uh, a mild disturbance. So the choice of a good threshold is very much system dependent, depending also on the type of uh, hardware, on the type of system and, and um, so it's, it's difficult to say something in general. And um, you may argue that a fixed threshold may not be the best choice, uh, 
and you may wish to have an adaptation of the pressure depending on the operative dynamic condition. Now, uh, as soon as you put a threshold, no matter if uh, small or large, you introduce some delay times with respect to when the actual fault is starting to act on your system. Uh, so let's consider that this instant is uh, T0. Uh, the fault is occurring and your residual is uh, really detecting something, but still below the threshold that you have chosen. So you have a delay until uh, the fault will move the residual above this threshold. Of course, these thresholds are for positive or negative values, so they should be considered in absolute terms. And of course, uh, there's a trade-off between delay times and false alarms, as I, say, uh, as I was saying before. So if you want to reduce the delay time, you tend to accept some false alarm. And the compromise is a matter of uh, design. Okay, so let's do a, a simple example, still taken from that paper that I mentioned before. So we have a nonlinear plant, and here, suppose that we have three possible faults. And uh, we have a, a detector for, uh, an estimator for detecting that any of these three faults occurred. And if this is the case, we will activate uh, three independent so a bank of three estimator, one for each fault i, number one, number two, and number three. Now suppose that fault number one is acting on your system. Uh, then uh, you will have profile of your output of your residual generators, of these estimators, that more or less may take this type of uh, time history. So first of all, uh, the uh, bank of isolators Stand, staying still before they are activated. So the second, third and fourth plots are zero until the detection time TD. Now at time T0 the fault starts occurring uh, and the associated residual for detection starts moving out from, from, from the zero and uh, we are using here a constant threshold and only when the signal uh, exceeds the threshold, then we detect and we activate the isolators. So at time TD, uh, you see that the profile of the isolator starts being non-zero because you're generating signal. And in this case, um, uh, the authors have used uh, adaptive thresholds that may depend on a number of questions. For instance, in the robot, you may have thresholds which are depending on the speed, the nominal speed at which you're doing the task. So if the speed is higher, then the uh, threshold will move uh, up. When the, you're going at low speed, then the threshold is very low. This is a possibility, just to make an example. So here we have this uh, adaptive threshold. And here the logic that they use is a kind of a negative logic, in the sense that you like to exclude one by one uh, the potential faults so that only one fault remains and then you have isolated that fault remember in this case the fault was number one so at a certain time after the detection instant TV and this time is labeled uh, with a blue circle T3 so at this time uh, your um, residual output of the third uh, generator will exceed its threshold. So you can exclude that this was the fault. Of course you can use also uh, a, a negated logic. This was the logic used in this paper. So from now on, no matter if this signal will return below the, the threshold or not, you have excluded that this was the fault acting on the system. But you have to wait more time because uh, the residual uh, generated by uh, the generator uh, 2 uh, and 1 uh, still are not conclusive. Now, after a while, at time t2, uh, the residual from the second generator exceeds its adaptive threshold. So you can exclude fold 2. And at this stage, uh, what remains is only fault one, so you have 
isolated also for q1. Okay, so this is a, a possibility, um, and now let's move to our main problem today. So, actuator detecting and isolating actuator faults in robots. This is the picture. We start with the model. Our approach will be fully model-based, and this is a pro, and there are also cons on this approach, because we need to know a, a good model of our robot. And here we are including several terms. Some of them may not be present, but indeed uh, the inertial part, so with the inertial matrix times the acceleration, we assume to have a, a robot with n joints and n actuators, and each actuator is moving a single joint. If this is not the case, you can manipulate the equation in such a way that on the right hand side you have an equivalent uh, actuation torque uh, performing work on the generalized coordinates of interest. So, but then you have centrifugal and Coriolis term if the inertia matrix is uh, configuration dependent, you may have gravity, you may have uh, non conservative term, which are dissipative term, viscous friction and static friction, I have considered in these cases. And uh, on the right hand side, we have the equation torque. But in fact, uh, this is the way in which we model uh, a fault. Namely, we suppose that the actual torque going to the robot is not the one that we are commanding, but there's some subtraction. And this subtraction is because of a possible fault. And this subtraction may take several forms. So, uh, first of all, we don't exclude that we have concurrency, so we may have faults at the same time on multiple uh, actuators. And how do we model the possibility of having faults? Here I have a, a list of possibilities. For instance, suppose that your motor at joint I is dead. So, there is not giving any torque, no longer torque. So you're, com you're requesting with your control law or with your open loop command that that actuator should deliver, let's say, at some instant, 25 newton meters, in fact, is not delivering anything to the robot. And you don't know this because you don't measure what is really going to the robot. So this is a total fault. Uh, a total fault means that on the right hand side, at that equation i corresponding to the actuator that uh, under, uh, underwent this type of fault, uh, ufi, so the fault in fact, uh, is cancelling completely the commanded torque, so that you have a zero on the right hand side for that equation. Indeed, you may have also, uh, let's say, a power loss, a partial fault, so that uh, you're asking 25 newton meter, but the system is only able to, uh, I mean, the actuator is only able to deliver 80% of the requested torque. So you have a, a factor going out, and this factor may go from 0 to 1 according to this formula. So, for instance, if you're delivering only 80% of any torque that you're requesting, then the epsilon there would be 0 0.2. So that uh, on the right hand side, you will have. Uh, UI minus 0 .2, uh, 0.2 UI, so 0 0.8 UI, so you're delivering 80%. And of course, this epsilon may change over time. But this, you can see that with this simple subtraction on the right hand side, we can model a uh, different interesting situation in practice. And this mathematical formalization is very important in any problem. Uh, here is another example. For instance, you may, uh, you may have a saturation and you don't expect to have a saturation. And so you don't know in advance that a motor can deliver uh, up to a certain amount of torque. So you're requesting more torques, but then if you're uh, reaching to a maximum, uh, then of course all the difference between what you are requesting and what is really going to the system is a fault, can be considered as a fault. Although this is a fault due to your absence of knowledge of the presence of a situation. But indeed, this may not be the 
rated saturation may be some other saturation that occurs, which is below the maximum one, but the scheme can be modeled exactly in the same way. And so on. There are other possibilities. For instance, you may have a bias in the torque delivered. So a constant offset, positive or negative, with respect to what you're uh, commanding at a given instant. Let's say uh, constantly one newton meter more than your request, or zero point, minus 0 0.2 newton meter uh, difference. There are also more complex situations. For instance, uh, there are situations in which the actuators fail because, in fact, uh, it's the actuator together with this uh, transmission that gets blocked. So at some point, the join becomes fully blocked. And this is, of course, a very severe uh, fault. If you're able to isolate this type of situation, then you should consider that uh, the two links connected by the joints become a single rigid body. Huh? They, they are not straight, they, they are forming probably an angle, but this angle is from now on fixed until you can intervene and substitute your uh, uh, motor. So if the robot, for instance, has extra degrees of freedom, you may reconfigure your Jacobian by eliminating the column associated to that joint, fixing uh, the proper coordinate, and then recompute your controller with the remaining joint. Now, writing uh, a blocking uh, situation, I will leave this as an exercise to you. It's not trivial. Uh, I'm just suggesting that you need to include also the acceleration into the picture and so on and so on. So you can consider in principle any type of uh, single or concurrent actuator faults, no matter which is their physical nature. No? In the modeling, they are all treated in the same way. Now, are we able to detect the presence of faults, any faults? And then, are we able to isolate which actuator has under, well, undergone a fault, and possibly what type of fault it is, what is the time profile of what is missing to our uh, delivered talk with respect to the one that uh, we were planning to uh, impose through the actuator. Now, we will consider this uh, as a single problem, in fact, because we are able to address the FDI problem as a whole for this type of uh, faults on, in robots. So, the working assumptions are uh, always important to remember. So, we have a number of signals and measurements available. Uh, for instance, we have the commanded input torque, the one coming from our uh, control law. Uh, I'm using torque here. Sometimes you command currents, but you know the relation between current and, and, and torque. So, the same would have been if we had uh, current in the right-hand uh, right side of our equation with the factor of conversion between current and delivered torque. So we, we, we know U, but of course we don't know UF, which is the purpose uh, of our uh, diagnosis. Uh, we assume the simple case, so that we can measure the full state of the robot, so both position Qs and velocities Q dots. In practice, this assumption can be relaxed because we know that we can estimate joint velocity from the position measurement. So, uh, and there are several ways for doing this. If you have a discrete time, you can use numerical uh, differentiation. Uh, but for the rest of my presentation, I will assume that the full state is measurable and available also to the uh, diagnostic system. The good news, however, is that we don't need any further sensor. So we call this, in a sense, uh, in a sense, sorry for the confusion, a sensorless approach, although we are measuring something from the state of the system, uh, because we don't need, don't need extra sensor for doing fault detection and isolation. In this sense, uh, this terminology makes uh, a lot of uh, impact in the, in, in, in the problem formulation and solution. So no further sensor other than those that from, with which the robot is normally always equipped. 
so encoders at the joint. The other working assumption is very strong, I would say. So we know a perfect dynamic model, the best possible dynamic model that we have. Okay. So uh, this dynamic model, of course, is the one in the absence of faults and neglecting any extra disturbances that may present, noise and so on, acting on the system. Uh, however, uh, we don't need any other model. So for instance, as opposed to many work in the literature, we don't have to model the type of faults if it's incipient which, or uh, if it's uh, abrupt. Uh, if it follows an exponential trend and to know what, what, is, what is this exponential trend, if it's sinusoidal, if it's a, a step variation, we don't need any information or, nor modeling about the type of actuator faults that may act uh, in our robot. The other nice thing is that uh, the fault detector and isolator will work uh, Whatever the, sp the specific input, uh, so the command, uh, is, a, is being um, is chosen for the robot. So it could be an open loop command, let's say sinusoidal torques or constant torques, or it may be the result of a state feedback of the linear type, like a PID or a PD control, or a nonlinear feedback as well. As long as we have the commanded input. Uh, the system will behave exactly the same way, I mean, in detecting uh, actuator faults. This is a very powerful result, I would say, which counterbalances the request of a, a very good dynamic mode. And finally, same story, uh, the robot may be doing some task in the Cartesian space, in the joint space, in any case it will follow some trajectories, so, some specific motion, well, we don't care what is this motion, it could be uh, standing still or moving, we will have no dependence at all of the FDI method, so uh, detection and isolation of uh, the faults on the actuators, uh, it will be completely independent of what type of specific motion the robot is doing at the time when the uh, fault will uh, occur. So, with this in mind, we, uh, how do we design a, a residual generator? In fact, we have to design an n-dimensional residual generator because we would like not only to detect that an actuator fault occurred, but which of the n actuator of the robot has failed. For this, uh, the concept of generalized momentum, which we have already encountered a couple of times, will be very useful. So the generalized momentum P is an n-dimensional vector which is the product of the inertia matrix times the joint velocity. And it could be used as one of the state variables, for instance, for doing direct dynamics together with Q. Instead of using Q and Q dot as state of your system, you can use Q and P. And in fact, this is what is also called a Hamiltonian formulation of the dynamics when you're using the generalized momentum. Now, this was left... Uh, sometimes as an exercise at home, now you can write explicitly what is the dynamic equation that the generalized momentum satisfies. So if you write P dot, and you write the uh, evolution of the generalized momentum in time, so you take the derivative of the right-hand side, so you will have m q double dot plus m dot q dot, and then in m q double dot uh, you can substitute the dynamic model in Euler-Lagrange form, and so on and so on. At some point, uh, you will have also the inclusion of the actual torque acting on your system, and the actual torque is the commanded torque U minus the faulty uh, torque uh, through which we have modeled a number of possible failures of our actuators. Now, the nice thing, uh, there's an extra term alpha, we will give now an expression for this uh, alpha term, but the nice point to uh, stress is that when you're writing those equations, you have a fully decoupled behavior between each component of the generalized momentum and each component of the total torque acting on your system. So pi dot will be only a function of ui minus ufi. 
okay? And then, of course, also of the ith component of this vector alpha. But all this extra vector, knowing the model, can be computed. And also u can be computed, so this information will be soon uh, be used in order to generate the residual. The residual is not p, but in fact we are monitoring the evolution of the generalized momentum in order to get the residual. Now, uh, the alpha vector, uh, I'm giving here one possible expression in a scalar way. Uh, later on, in the next lecture, when we will deal with collision detection and isolation, and the terminology is exactly the same because we will see that collision can be considered as a, a fault to the system, and an unexpected fault. Uh, we will uh, uh, give further expression there, but here I'm using this scalar expression. So alpha i in the vector in the n-dimensional vector alpha of q q dot is the sum of gravity term of the viscous and, and, and static friction if present uh, yes uh, and uh, and indeed of a, of a term which is related to the uh, velocity term it's a quadratic term in the velocity with a partial derivative of the total matrix with respect to the scalar ty with a minus sign in front so it's a strange term it's not a Coriolis a centrifugal term, but it's something related to that, okay? And in fact, if you do the computation uh, of the dynamics of the generalized momentum, this is the result, and you can check uh, your uh, computation on, with this formula. Okay, so uh, this is the property that we use, and you can see that we are using a physical property. So we are not really relating to the specific robot, uh, as long as the model that we have of our robot, so the dynamic model, Euler Lagrangian symbolic dynamic model, uh, works fine, then uh, this dynamic of the general momentum is very useful. And in fact, the definition of uh, a vector of residual, an n dimensional vector of residual, is the following one. So we define the residual with a vector r, uh, it's an n dimensional vector, as I said. And uh, uh, which is a, a gain, a diagonal gain with positive values. And the difference between the integral of the expression that we have just seen before without the uf signal, which is not available. So it's the difference between uh, the commanded torque minus this state dependent function alpha minus the residual itself, which is something that we generate so we can compute and, and use. So we do the integral of this over time. I'm not putting any uh, limits to the integration term, but it's, it will start at time zero, and this is uh, the time t is the instantaneous value of this residual, which will continue to change over time. So it's this integral minus the generalized momentum, so mq times q dot. So, uh, is this getting our results? Well, in fact, you can show very simple that this is the way you implement the residual, the way in which you compute the residual. And for computing the residual, first of all, and this is very important, you don't use any joint acceleration, not even an estimate, because this is only state dependent, plus the knowledge of the input. Okay. And with respect to other former method existing in the literature, you don't even have to invert the robot inertia in order to get the acceleration from your model, because we assume that we have a full model, so we could extract the acceleration from the model, but then we require to invert in real time the inertia matrix, which is uh, maybe uh, an, uh, uh, an expensive operation. So, uh, we um, don't use joint acceleration or estimation measurement, uh, and don't invert the robot inertia matrix for computing this uh, vector of residual. And now, supposing that now we have perfect model, uh, knowledge, uh, we can write how we expect the residual to behave, what will be the time evolution of the residual. 
How do we do this? We just take the derivative of the above expression. Pay attention. This formula, r dot minus kr plus kuf, is not a formula that we can implement because, in fact, the, the uf is appearing here. It's just a formula following our analysis to understand when we compute r, what will r tell us, how will r uh, behave and evolve over time. So in order to get this formula, you simply take the expression of the residual and make a time derivation on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. So you have r dot on one side, and then k times the derivative of the integral, let the uh, argument there. So you will have u of t, of time t, minus alpha at q, q dot at the instant t, minus the residual itself, time t. So u minus alpha minus r. And then minus p dot. But p dot, we have seen that uh, the dynamics of p dot is exactly u minus uf minus alpha. So u and alpha will be cancelled. And what remains is just uh, uh, minus uf um, and, uh, sorry, a uf and a minus r both multiplied by the gain k, and so this is what you obtain. And since k is diagonal, uh, this is a very strong result. In fact, what is this? Uh, it says that if we generate uh, the residual in this way, uh, we will get as evolution n decoupled filter, because k is diagonal, so we can work uh, on every component. Our i dot will be minus k i, the, uh, i-th element on the diagonal of the game matrix k, ri, plus ki uf i. So the i-th component will be excited only by the i-th fold, which is the fold of actuator i, by none other. So you see that this is automatically giving uh, detection and isolation. Moreover, uh, the form of this uh, expression is that of a stable first order filter with unitary gain and with a co time constant which is uh, equal to the inverse of the gain that we are using. So if you want a prompt response, you will use a large ki so that the time constant of the exponential that will follow the, uh, let's say, a step response when you have a step variation in uf, so you have a, a, an abrupt change uh, an abrupt arising of the fault, which moves from zero to whatever value, and it has unitary gain. So if the fault remains constant, in particular, R will converge exactly, Ri will converge exactly to the value of Ufi. In fact, you can see this if you, tra if you transform in the Laplace domain uh, this equation, you have a transfer function between the i uh, fault acting on uh, your robot, so the i to the fault, and the i component of the residual, uh, this will be equal to uh, ki over s plus ki, uh, the gain is unitary, in fact you can divide by ki, and you obtain exactly uh, a first order filter with a constant uh, time constant tau i. So as a result, detection and isolation has been achieved not only, but if we can take k and each component of k of the diagonal k matrix uh, sufficiently large, then we can approximately uh, say that r is reproducing the time behavior of the fold, and this for each component. So we have uh, almost for free, uh, if k is sufficiently large, also identified, not only isolated, but identified also the time profile of the fault. And from there on, we can classify if this was a total fault of the actuator or a partial one, a power loss, a bias, whatever. Okay, so this is uh, all coming uh, at the same time. Of course, we cannot take k enormously large because uh, then noises and other uncertainty will come into practice. Moreover, we need to use a threshold in any case because of what I said in general is applied also to this method. But this decoupling uh, and linearization of the dynamics is very important. In fact, uh, 
This is the way in which the receiver generator uh, is constructed because uh, in my experience, uh, the students before your generation um, had trouble the first time that they need to implement this receiver generator, for instance, in a, in a simulink uh, diagram. So I'm following more or less a simulink style diagram, but this is in fact a general block diagram. So we have on top, in the blue box, a robot subject to some command. The U may come from some state information QP dot and some from reference trajectory that we like to uh, follow, but we don't care. And whatever, as long we have just said that uh, you may come from any type of command. And of course, uh, the robot is subject to you, but also to an internal UF, uh, which is subtracting. Uh, you can also use a plus here, but um, we model it as a subtraction of the actual torque. Uh, if you had a plus there, it would be exactly the same. But anyway, uh, so the robot evolves, and we can measure only the states of Q and Q dot. Now we use this, together with U, into the residual generator. So there are three types of signal coming, the measurement of Q, the measurement or the computation of Q dot, by numerical differentiation of the encoder measurement, and then uh, the commanded torque. And then you evaluate the generalized momentum using Q and Q dot, with the formula m of q times q dot, you evaluate the vector alpha with its all component, and then uh, you take the uh, input u, you subtract alpha, you subtract the current value of the residual output, uh, and this will be integrated. And then the, integra the integral of this term, uh, you subtract the actual generalized momentum, you multiply by the diagonal k, uh, gain k and you get again the residual generator uh, output r with its all component. Now uh, inside we have an integrator here or a, 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 a bank of integrators so we have n integrator in fact one for each component of the r vector so one for each uh, generalized coordinate of our robot and we have to initialize this. So the correct initialization so I'm calling uh, the state of this uh, p hat because I'm reminding that I'm monitoring, in fact, the generalized momentum. In fact, soon after I will make a difference between the p hat and the actual p. So we have to set p hat at time zero at the beginning of our experiment, of our operation, uh, equal to the generalized momentum of the robot. For instance, if the robot starts from zero, we have to set zero there. Otherwise, we'll put m, uh, p hat of 0 equal to p of 0, so m of q times q dot with q dot of 0 different from 0. So this is the general scheme which implements the formula of the residual. As you can see, we are, we are not using uf, we are not writing our dot anywhere, and we're just computing algebraically u as uh, an integration minus evaluation of the generalized momentum. In fact, this residual generator can be uh, seen as having a, a structure of an observer. It's not a state observer, so we cannot guarantee convergence to the actual value, but it's an observer of a disturbance, and we don't know in advance the evolution of the disturbance. So the best we can do is to follow closely the evolution of the disturbance. In our case, the disturbance is, in fact, the fold, and although we have mentioned that we distinguish the fold from disturbances, but now uh, this is the terminology that is being used, so we have neglected the presence of disturbance. Uh, we will consider disturbances uh, by uh, increasing the uh, threshold, in a sense. Okay. So, uh, uh, if we look back at the diagram here, uh, I can uh, write the evolution of p hat and the evolution of p hat, which is what is before the integrator, again, is u, again I'm going back, before the integrator in the orange, so this is p hat dot, 
So p hat dot is uh, a summation of three terms, is u minus alpha minus r. But r itself is k times p hat minus p. So if we put the two things together, we have the first equation, which is nothing else than what we get from the block diagram. And then we define the residual as k p hat minus p. Pay attention, this is uh, opposite inside. So, uh, this is in fact the dynamic observer, and we are observing through R, through the output of this dynamic system, which has as many states p hat as the number of generalized coordinates or the number of uh, actuators uh, of our robot. So, this dynamic observer uh, is generating a, an R which is more or less so getting toward the value of the external disturbances, which are are false and which has linear error dynamics as an observer, although the system is nonlinear as a whole. Uh, it's linear provided that uf is constant, otherwise it has an approximately linear uh, uh, expression. In fact, we can we can compute this uh, observation error. So the difference between uf, the actual disturbance that we would like to capture with the r, and with the uh, value of r. So this is the definition of the observation error, and let's look at its dynamics, so evolution over time. So E dot ops is equal to UF dot minus R dot. UF dot will be left untouched from now on. Now R dot, you take the expression above, you take the derivative of R, so this is uh, minus K uh, P hat dot minus P dot. So again, uh, p hat dot, you have the dynamics of the observer, so it's uh, u minus alpha minus k p minus p, uh, p hat, which is minus r, in fact, so it's the opposite of r, so minus r, and then you subtract p dot, subtract p dot, which is, uh, in fact, u minus uf minus alpha, I've just reorganized there, and you can see that u and alpha will cancel each other and what is left is simply uh, minus k times uf minus r but uh, uf minus r is exactly the observation error so what is left is that the evolution of the observation error is minus k the error itself so this would give an exponential converging to zero time behavior but then there's also a forcing term uf dot, and we don't know what is uf dot because we don't predict the future of the evolution of the fold. But if it is constant, then this will disappear, and we have exactly a linear error of dynamics for the observation. Otherwise, we'll be approximated by this. So we will, with large k, we will catch up after uf, uh, very close to it, and we will see this in a number of. Uh, uh, simulation and uh, experiment. Simulation are more clear to let us uh, understand what's going on. So let's work out a simple example. Uh, you may not be surprised that we are taking again the planner to our robots uh, that we have used uh, many times to illustrate uh, in a simple way more general concept. In this case we assume that this is under gravity. Okay. Uh, so, um, we neglect for just for simplicity the presence of friction. So, we start with a um, fault free and no disturbance model, which has this usual form. Now, uh, at some point, there will be uh, a fault on one or both of the actuators. So, the model will become the following one u minus uf, as we said before. Now, many times uh, we will use also a factorization of the correlation centrifugal term. Uh, this may be useful when we write uh, alpha in a vector format, which we don't do here, but uh, in the next lecture on collision detection and avoidance, this will be a, a key factor, in fact. So, uh, what is this model in our case? You can recognize the inertia matrix of a 
planners to a robot with three uh, dynamic coefficients, a1, a2, and a3, times the acceleration. The uh, second term, vector term, is, uh, are the cordialis and centrifugal terms. In fact, you see that the cordialis uh, is present only on first joint, and on the second joint, uh, you have only on the uh, centrifugal term. Well, you have also a centrifugal term on the first joint with q dot 2 square. The third term is, in fact, the gravity with two more dynamic coefficients, a4 and a5. And on the right hand side, you have the two applied torque, I mean, two commanded torque, u1 and u2, possibly uh, with the presence of fold, which will subtract something from these uh, two torques. Now, the residual. Uh, we have to compute the generalized momentum. P is trivial because it's the inertia matrix times the velocities, and the inertia matrix is given in the slide. Uh, for the uh, integral that is present in the, the expression of the residual, we need the alpha. And if we compute the alpha, which has the general format that we have seen, there is no viscous friction and static friction, so only a term. Uh, which comes from the partial derivative of the inertia matrix plus the gravity term. However, we know already that Q1 is a so-called cyclic variable for the inertia, so it will never appear in any inertia matrix of any robot. So the partial derivative in the first component of alpha, alpha 1, the partial derivative of m with respect to Q1 will be zero. So this term is not there, and only the gravity Component, uh, the component of the gravity vector will be the first component of alpha. Uh, for the second, instead, we will have this uh, type of uh, expression, and you can uh, recognize that this term, which is quadratic in the velocity, in fact, is none of the centrifugal or Coriolis terms which appears in the model. So it should be, com it has to be computed, and only if we compute it properly, uh, we have the nice. Uh, dynamics for the residual vector R. So, with this in mind, uh, I've done some simulation. First, very simple. So, uh, the first simulation is uh, with uh, uh, open loop command. So, we are giving uh, a sinusoidal uh, command to joint 1, and you can see it on the left hand side with a peak of 10 newton meters and with a period which is very long, of 25 seconds, uh, while on the second joint we are giving a, 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 a periodic uh, train of uh, steps um, with amplitude 5 newton meters, only positive, uh, while the first sinusoid has zero mean, the second signal on the second joint has a positive value of 2.5 uh, as a mean. And we assume that uh, we have a fault on the first joint, a total fault, uh, between uh, 15 seconds and 20 seconds. And then the torque returns to be the same as before. So it's a, it's a total fault. Uh, same story, a total fault for the second actuator, but in a different time interval. Between 12 seconds and 18 seconds, the second motor is not delivering any torque. So we have concurrence during the uh, intersection of these two intervals, so between 15 and 18 seconds, uh, we have both uh, faults acting. And this is also an intermittent situation because uh, we had the fault and then this fault disappeared. So this is the uh, simulation setup and the uh, model uh, faults in terms of torques. Of course, we don't know. I mean, in the simulation, we, we built this type of faults, but the residual is not aware of this. So uh, we are not cheating here in the follow -up. So again, uh, you see the actual torques going to the robot. So the one faulted for some uh, interval of time. And if we look at the evolution of the joint position that we measure and their velocity, I would say, okay, they, these are random motion. 
oscillatory motion. In fact, these two commands are open loop. We don't know what will really the robots do, but we don't care, in fact. The only thing that I would like to point out here is that looking at the evolution of the joint position, we don't have a clear evidence that a fault occurred and when this occurred. In fact, you can see that uh, there are growing oscillations when both faults are gone. So, when the system is properly functioning. So, you cannot really understand from uh, joint position or velocity what's going on, because these are the results of the inertial coupling of the effect of gravity. Uh, so, the fault uh, acting as a subtracting torque are in fact affecting uh, in a uh, complex way and interacting way all components. So this is why we're using the generalized momentum, because the generalized momentum, in fact, has a decoupled dependence on the presence of uh, actuated torque and as well as faulted torques. So, uh, and here is the uh, FNDI uh, result. So again, I'm reporting the same actual torques. I have used uh, uh, diagonal values of 50 and 50 for the gain in the residual. And you can see that in this it's a very neat simulation where there are no disturbance, nothing else, uh, the residual are doing what we expect. So they are zero when there is no fault, not on the first actuator, nor on the second actuator. And then as soon as the second actuator, in fact, has a fault, you see that the residual R2 uh, goes different from zero and is reconstructing, you can see a slightly uh, exponential increase. In fact, the, constant, the time constant is 1 over 50, so it's uh, 0 0.02 second. And uh, the uh, residual goes exactly to the value, you know? and then goes to zero, and, and then again. So it's mimicking the missing part of the torque at joint 2 while the residual one stays at zero because there's no fault at this time uh, on the first joint torque. At time t equal 15 seconds, uh, we will see that the residual, in fact, has a discontinuity, the residual of joint one, and then it follows uh, very closely the uh, missing sinusoidal part from the red curve on the left-hand side, uh, and then in between uh, the fault on the second joint disappears, so the residual goes back to zero in the blue curve, uh, uh, definitely. And when the fault on the first joint goes back to zero, also the residual goes back to zero. So this is really uh, detection, isolation, even in the concurrent case. And moreover, kind of a identification, because we have almost reconstructed the uh, actual uh, missing torque. So we can say that this was, in fact, a total uh, failure of both actuators in different uh, periods of time. So uh, the second simulation is more, slightly more realistic. Uh, here I'm putting only uh, a total fault on the second torque, all the rest remains the same, but I'm adding noise on the first channel. So uh, I'm adding to the commanded torque, the sinusoidal torque for the first joint, I'm adding some white noise. And you can tell it from the uh, let's say, sl small oscillation around the sinusoid in the left plot. Now, what happens? Uh, uh, if we look at the residual, uh, we'll see that uh, the residual at joint 1 remains close to zero, despite the fact that we have uh, a faulty actuation at, at joint 2 at some time. Okay? So it's independent, it's decoupled. Uh, it, it is feeling what is missing from the information, so we don't know that there is a, uh, an extra disturbance, and in fact, is slightly bouncing around the zero, and this is why we need a threshold, because the threshold should cover uh, this oscillation, this mild oscillation, because otherwise we would uh, see, say that there is a, a fault on actuator one, while this is only due to disturbance and noise. Okay. On the other hand, uh, despite the presence of 
uh, this disturbance, the evolution of the other re residual is completely unaffected. So on the second channel, what is going on on the first channel, no matter if it's a disturbance or a fault, uh, this will not affect the second result, the disturbance. So we have a fully uh, decoupled or decoupling property. And this is another advantage of the approach. This is why we are doing both detection and isolation, at least in this nominal condition. Now, uh, let's move to a real experiment. At the time when we developed this theory, um, we didn't have um, a robot available for doing this such test to emulate a fault. It's quite dangerous, no? because uh, you never know what will happen. So simulation can be done forever, but in an experiment, uh, things may go wrong. So uh, we decided to use uh, uh, one academic uh, robot, which is an under-tweeted one, uh, developed by Quanser. Uh, it's still working in our lab right now, although uh, at the moment you don't have the possibility of accessing the lab for the known reasons, but this is the Quanser Penduba. It's a 2R planar arm moving in the vertical plane with the first joint being actuated, and so the first link being actuated uh, by DC motor uh, and having also an encoder at the joint and the second joint, so the elbow joint is not actuated although there is an encoder mounted at the second joint to measure its uh, relative angle with respect to the, um, the, the first link uh, okay, uh, just to have an idea, so this under-activated robot cannot go everywhere, it needs to do some acrobatic maneuver, and here on the right-hand side uh, I will show you uh, one video where we are using uh, nonlinear control law for partial feedback linearization in fact, plus a uh, linear quadratic regulator to do the swing up from the downward equilibrium at rest, and no torque being applied, to the upward equilibrium. Okay, so this is a, a swing up maneuver that we do only with the first actuator. Now, you may wonder, well, uh, there's only a one actuator here, so there's only one fault that can happen. Can we talk about uh, detection? Sure, but isolation makes no sense. However, we don't know that there's no motor on the second joint. So the, the, the trick of this experimental setting is that we assume that there could be a motor on the second joint. Of course, as soon as we are requesting uh, a torque produced by the missing motor at joint 2, uh, there will be no motor there to deliver this torque, and so we will have a total fault from the point of view of diagnosis. Okay? So this uh, accept this emulation, uh, but in this way we could do uh, a number of uh, interesting experiments without crashing the system. Of course, we will make also some, uh, uh, we will uh, emulate some uh, fault also on the real motor on joint one as well. Uh, in all the uh, following uh, results, uh, we will use uh, a digital uh, sampling of one millisecond of our control and of our detector. Uh, the residual gains are set to 50, as in the simulation for both uh, joints, I would say. Uh, we will use also threshold for fault detection, which are on the order of uh, uh, 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 3 newton meters, so small value for uh, thresholding the signal. So let's uh, look at the first experiment. Uh, this experiment is done, as in the first simulation, in open loop. So the motor 1 is driven by a voltage, in fact, the voltage will generate some current, the current will generate some uh, torque. In fact, this transformation is nonlinear. In fact, uh, although the uh, applied voltage is sinusoidal and has a period of uh, 2 pi uh, second, uh, yes, uh, what you see on the left hand side is a, a, a perturbation, uh, apart from the Fault. It's a perturbation of a sinusoid. In fact, it's what the actual command, torque command, uh, comes to the motor. Now, 
uh, we will use a, a bias fault um, on the first torque so between second three and second four so for one second uh, we assume that we are commanding uh, uh, a value which is higher than what we are really applying okay so we are emulating this fault at the same time between 3.5 second and 4.5 second we are requesting a constant torque this constant torque is uh, 0.05 newton meter as i can see from the left hand side and of course there's no motor that can de de deliver uh, or provide this newton meter so this is a total fault so again, we have two faults acting either separately or for a, a short period of half a second uh, in concurrency. So both are present. Now, if we look at the evolution of the joint position, joint one and joint two, so the blue uh, continuous line is uh, the position of joint one, uh, the dashed red line is the position of joint two, we start from zero, zero, which is the downward equilibrium, and then we see uh, this type of evolution. So there will be some, some oscillation uh, of uh, both joints. It's a very uh, slow sinusoidal voltage being applied uh, and also with a small peak of 0 0.04 uh, newton meter effect. Okay, so uh, again, uh, here is the result, uh, the experimental result of the residual. And you can see that the residual for joint one uh, bounces around zero. And what you see is purely noise due to the measurement, due to the PWM uh, generator, which is commanding the DC motor, and so on and so on. Now, at time t equals three seconds, when we have the bias uh, torque, so we have less torque than uh, what expected, uh, we will see that the residual of joint one grows and goes almost uh, constant. Okay, and and this is in fact the missing torque at joint one. At time uh, um, four second, this comes back to zero. It has some uh, residual part due to. Uh, other than any effect that has been not correctly modeled, like friction, for instance, and then returns around zero. At the same time, the uh, residual on joint two, where there is no motor, when we are not applying any motor, in fact, any torque, this is bouncing. Uh, there's some noise evident also in the red plots on the red uh, on the red curve in the right plot. And you see that it remains to zero. Then, when we are asking for the 0.05 newton meters, uh, this is not going to the system. So the residual is suddenly bouncing off zero and getting exactly to the missing value of torque with some transient behavior staying there and then going back to zero when we uh, remove this request and uh, no torque is being asked to the second joint, which has no motor either. Now, in the second experiment, uh, we uh, instead used, uh, made a, a regulation. So we are commanding the first joint, the only one that has a motor, uh, to go from uh, the downward position of equilibrium at zero velocity to 30 degrees. Okay. Now, the, the other passive joints, indeed, will oscillate uh, for a while there is some friction that this oscillation will be damped out. And we are regulating this position with a PID control. Uh, we need an integral term, now you know this very well, because otherwise at 30 degrees there would be, uh, if we get exactly 30 degrees and we are at rest, there would be no action with the PD controller to counterbalance the gravity in this situation. Although the structure is very light, we need an integral term. Now, Again, uh, we try to um, stress also concurrency. So on the real motor, uh, there are 0 0.3 seconds between 1.7 and 2 seconds, uh, where we will have 50% of power loss. Now remember, 50% of power loss means that the PID command that is trying to bring the error to zero uh, 
and so generating torque on the motor, uh, with the motor one, all of a sudden it's like reducing the gains, no? because it, this torque that should be commanded, in fact, is only half of it is getting to the system. So uh, the error will stay there and the integral part will accumulate. So all of a sudden the control uh, torque will increase and in fact the, uh, the values will, uh, will, will have a peak, uh, as you can see from the left hand side. And then when uh, this is gone, uh, it will go back to the originally commanded one. Uh, on the second, for, with a short period of concurrency, uh, same situation for the second joint. There's no motor, we are not requesting any torque. Sometimes we are requesting 0.05 newton meters from this missing motor, and of course, this is completely a total fault. So, uh, from the evolution of the joint position, you may just notice some small transient in the growth of the of the uh, position of the joint one position towards 30 degrees, and this should reflect the presence of uh, a fault. But in fact. Uh, we cannot really tell from this that a fault occurred. Rather, uh, if now we compare uh, the commanded torque, the actual torque going to uh, the commanded torque, sorry, going to the system uh, with the residual, you see that uh, again uh, in red the residual for joint two is almost zero and grows to zero point zero minus zero point zero five when we are requesting a torque that the uh, absence of motor uh, prevents us to deliver, while on the, the first residual uh, is bouncing around zero because of noise, and again we need a, a threshold here, uh, and then jumps up, and it follows exactly uh, the missing torque, okay? And then there's an undershoot, and then it goes back to zero again. Now, uh, I made also uh, a third experiment, because here we, we felt, well, here we are missing 50% of the, of the actual torque, so this power loss is very large, and probably we could detect this situation anyway. So what happens if we reduce uh, to 10% the power loss on model 1? All the rest remaining exactly the same. So you see here that the commanded torque, uh, now you can really, mm, it's harder to tell that something happened. Okay. And even, even more from the joint position, the folds, both on the real motor and on the fake motor, let's say, are completely unobservable, and let pass me this term, uh, from the evolution of uh, this joint position. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you see that those signals are very noisy. And why they are noisy? Well, the main uh, source is the fact uh, that we are using a PWM modulation uh, to drive the DC motor. So uh, to get rid or to handle or comply with this noise, uh, we implemented also a dynamic filtering of the residual. So instead of using the residual as such and having threshold, and the threshold uh, are reported here, uh, nine uh, uh, millimeter meters for the uh, first motor and two millimeter meters for the second joint, there's no motors there. So this dynamic filtering works as follows. We define some set and reset interval, short interval, and we accept the crossing of a threshold, so the detection of uh, an isolation in this case of a fault, only if we stay above the threshold at least for 0.02%. And then we say, okay, we detected the fault. Otherwise, we uh, don't react, so we don't generate any, any signal. We put the signal of the output of the residual to zero. And similarly, when the fault ends, we detect that uh, we can reset to normal, uh, the system has reset to normal operation, so that the residual uh, should go down to zero. Uh, only if it stay below for at least uh, a T reset time, 
which is uh, here a slightly longer 0.03. In fact, we are more interested in a shorter setting time than in the resetting time. So we are more interested in promptly recognizing, uh, detecting the presence of a fault than detecting the ending of a fault. But anyway, uh, this allows us to clean very much the residual, as you will see now in the next slide, but I want to comment this before showing the result, in the next plot before showing them. So indeed, uh, this uh, comes to a price. And the price is an increase, a delay in the detection, and the delay which is at least the time uh, set, uh, 200 of a second. And in fact, this is what happened. Here uh, on the top uh, plot, you can see the, um, the residual as such, both residuals. You can also recognize uh, in dashed blue and dashed red line, although the dashed red line are covered by the blue plots, uh, the threshold used, in fact, nine, um, to 10 to the minus three Newton meters, so, almost 10 to the minus 2, so always uh, 100 of a newton meter is the threshold for the um, first residual, and uh, 2 milli newton meters is the threshold for the second residual. Now you can see that the first residual from time to time peaks out of the threshold, although this happens when there is no fault at all. So if we don't use a dynamic filtering because of this noise, Either we force the threshold to be larger than those values, and then we would have anyway a lot of uh, false negative. Okay, so we don't recognize uh, faults which are small enough. Uh, instead, by using the dynamic filtering, uh, this peak stays over the threshold for less than the T set time, less than two hundred of a second, so they are not associated to uh, uh, a non-zero residual. Okay. In fact, the filter residual is shown below, and you can see the first blue peak uh, right immediately, and this is completely gone. And everything is set to zero until, really, the residual grows above the value of the threshold and stays there for at least 0.02 second, and this is when the blue plus in the second uh, the, the blue um, uh, curve in the second plot is being shown. And same story for the second, and same story also for the resetting uh, where we are using the reset of 0.03 second. So only when we are going down below, now so it's dynamic because it it's not just crossing the threshold, but it's crossing going up or crossing coming down. So, depending on the previous state, so it's a, a dynamic filtering in this sense. So, only when the residual goes below the threshold, let's call, let's talk about the first residual, only when the residual goes below the R1 threshold, so 9 to, to 10 to the power of minus 3 newton meters, and stays below for at least 0 0.03 seconds, then you can bring to zero the residual and say uh, the uh, fault has gone. Okay? And you see that the um, filtered residual are much cleaner than before, and the price to pay is a small uh, delay in detection of the two transition. Now, uh, this concludes the treatment uh, of this class of actuation faults, uh, let's see what are possible extension of the same methodology, so uh, of monitoring the generalized momentum or using the generalized momentum in order to build, to design a residual generator. So, uh, first of all, um, we have uh, extended this to the presence of uh, flexible transmission, so for instance, the model of robot with elastic joints, uh, and in that case, uh, the method is even simpler because uh, it uses only the uh, dynamics on the motor side of the joint, which is much simpler than the dynamics on the link side. Or 
uh, if we include some dynamics in the actuation. So if we assume that we are commanding voltage, but in fact uh, current is not instantaneously coming in the armature circuit and therefore the applied torque, which is algebraic related to the current, but dynamically related to the voltage. So if uh, this dynamics is relevant and we include a further dynamics, we can design a receiver also in the presence of this extra actuator dynamics. And this is one extension, both extensions, I will not present it here, but uh, I, you can find it in the reference at the end of the uh, slides. The other uh, modification that we made is indeed handle parametric uncertainty in the robot dynamic model. Maybe this was one of our first uh, uh, concern, uh, at least when we are not developed a reliable identification method of the dynamics. So uh, we try to make this adaptive and we make is adaptive, although uh, we need some estimation of the acceleration in that case. So you, you can uh, handle also, you can start also with uh, uh, an uncertain model and you, in a sense, adapt the residual generator, not the model. <coughs> there are, uh, we made also some modifications for uh, considering sensor faults and detecting and isolating uh, some classes of sensor force. Now, to be honest, uh, the uh, frequency to which sensor may experience failures and faults is much higher than the frequency to which actuators may fail. So it would be much more interesting if this uh, whole machinery was developed first for sensor faults and then possibly for actuators faults. But this is the way it is. This method works fine also for classes of sensor faults which do not include, for instance, the failure of encoders. Okay. Why is that? Because uh, since it, it is based on the concept of generalized momentum, it applies to faults that works at the torque or at the acceleration level. And th they may come from actuators, like we have seen, or, for instance, if you have a fault in a force torque sense. So at some point, you're measuring a uh, force with your sensor, typically mounted at the wrist, but in fact, the force, the actual force is different. So the actual force is that the one that is driving your system when you're in contact with the environment and you're measuring this force, but you expect to have what you measure. So if you have a, a fault in the measuring system, this will create a problem. And you would like to detect if your fault, if your force torque sensor is having the failure. And since this is working at the force level, uh, the force is equivalent to a joint torque, uh, to the Jacobian transpose, which is equivalent to the acceleration. So if you had an accelerometer and you had a fault in an accelerometer, that could be treated, although we didn't do that uh, so far, it could be treated, uh, I expect, uh, in the same way as we do uh, the actuation fault. Of course, uh, with modification, as you will see in one simple example. Now, uh, so far, we always uh, thought, uh, I mean, uh, worked under the assumption that there could be concurrency, concurrency of the actuator faults, and if we are considering sensor faults, concurrency of sensor faults, let's say of the force torque sensor, or even concurrency of both of them. However, there are restrictions in obtaining uh, fault detection and isolation uh, under the assumption of possible concurrency. Pay attention. They don't need to be concurrent, but if we assume that they could be, then uh, there is the condition for obtaining FDI, which are general conditions formulated for nonlinear systems, uh, are very uh, demanding, okay? So you may reasonably assume that you're not so unfortunate that you have at the same time multiple faults, so you may enlarge the number of faults uh, and list, let's say, actuator faults and let's say faults of the fault or, of, um, force or sensor, but you assume that only one at a time will happen, okay? So this is your uh, basic assumption. And then, if this is true, 
you can construct still uh, a residual generator that uh, provides detection and isolation. So, uh, but in this case, you need to use, a, a, let's say, a beyond or, or a, in cascade to the residual that you have generated so far, and we will see how to generate this also for this class of four-star sensor faults. These are continuous signal, but you have to manipulate them with a discrete logic, and then you can achieve isolation. I think that the two examples that I will present later on will be very clear on that. Uh, among the possible uh, torque faults no, that, you, uh, that occur at the joint level, of course, one are the actuator that are not delivering the commanded torque, but you may consider also the presence of unmodeled friction as also some, something that is keeping away torque, useful torques produced by the motor. So even if the motors are producing the right torque, you may have part of this gone because of the presence of friction that you have not modeled. So it's like having a permanent fault, because friction is always there, acts differently depending on if you're standing still or you're moving uh, your joints. So it uh, has a generic profile, and since we don't model and don't want to model this uh, complex friction effect, this can be handled uh, as a, a fault, and we can use the same type of uh, fault detection and isolation approach in order to uh, detect isolate is simple because friction occurs locally only to each joint but also make a step further use this information for compensating the model friction so for removing friction from the picture by control but not using a model but using this estimation based on a, a, a suitable residual and I will show just some result without the theory behind, but the theory is relatively simple once you have understood it for the actuator faults. And finally, uh, I will say a few words uh, about combined approach between model-based, like the one that we have uh, seen so far, and signal-based approaches to FDR. So let's uh, work directly on a, on a simple example and consider still our uh, planner to a robot, um, mounting a four-star sensor on its end effector. This could be a six-dimensional four-star sensor, but since everything uh, works in the plane and we assume only point contact, then the only uh, force that we are interested in measuring are the two components Fx and Fy. Uh, by the way, this component are measure it in the frame attached to the force sensor, which is the last frame, frame 2, let's say, in the dynamic task of the convention, in this case. Okay. So, uh, when we are uh, moving the robot freely, and again under gravity, here I'm using also the S, uh, the factorization of the colorless and centrifugal term, um, we may have no contact or have a contact, so on the right hand side, when we have contact, uh, we will have a force F acting on the system, independently of the fact that we have a sensor or not. Okay, So F on the right-hand side, multiplied by J transpose, is the contact force that we have when the end effector is in contact with the environment. Stiff or compliant that it may be. Now, since we have a force or sensor, now this force should be measured by our force sensor. And we call Fm the measurement of this force. And if everything works fine, Fm will be equal to F. But in fact, if the force or sensor is having a fault, any type of fault, a bias, and this is very common, by the way, a residual bias after you have, uh, it's like an hysteresis phenomenon, or, or uh, one of the strain gauge inside uh, has failed, so you cannot not uh, measure anything along one direction or the other, and so on and so on. But I'm not interested now in, in dealing uh, the specific causes of this fault, but we can model the fault 
in the way you see here. And this shows that uh, the fold, this type of fold of the force or sensor, act almost in the same way as uh, the previous actuator sensor, uh, actuator, uh, actuator fold act on the dynamics only with the Jacobian transpose placed in front of it. Okay, and then there's an extra term which is measured uh, by the sensor, the Fn. So, uh, we need the Jacobian, uh, Jacobian transpose, and since uh, the measurements are in the frame uh, of the end effector, then I'm writing the standard Jacobian, this is an exercise for you, but expressed in the end effector frame. And this takes this simple form. As you can see, uh, the determinant is still a function of, uh, it's still the same as originally, because there's only a rotation uh, between the Jacobian expressed in frame zero and the Jacobian expressed in frame two, which is the sensor frame in this case. Uh, but uh, you may appreciate that the expression of the Jacobian is much simpler in this case. However, this Jacobian may become singular exactly when the kinematics becomes singular, when the arm is stretched or folded. Then, in that case, uh, we may have a trouble and we will see uh, later on how to deal with this. Now, in fact, uh, here is a kind of a non-conventional way of handling the things uh, because instead of taking the inverse of the Jacobian or the inverse of the transpose, which we may need in order to isolate the fault F uh, of F sub F uh, in red, we use uh, the adjoint. You, you may remember that the adjoint, I mean, in order to invert the matrix, uh, you take the adjoint, so you take the minor associated to each element of the uh, matrix, eliminating the row and column associated to that uh, element, and then you divide by the determinant. And this is the inverse. So the adjoint is just the inverse multiplied by the determinant. And since it's the determinant that goes to zero that causes problem, in this way, uh, using the adjoint rather than the inverse, you don't invert exactly the matrix, but uh, when you're close or in a singularity, the most that, uh, the, the worst that can happen is that the adjoint goes to zero. Okay, so that probably in our fault diagnosis problem, fault detection problem, we will not be able to detect anything. Mm? Okay, but at least this is a robust to singularity, so things will not explode. Now, uh, believe me or not, this from the general theory that we developed for this class of uh, folds, the residual generator has the dynamics expressed by this long formula. So its state is Z, so this is a first order equation, z dot is equal to minus the adjoint of the transpose of the Jacobian matrix. Remember that like inversion and transposition commute, also transposition and adjunction, so computing the adjunction commute, so you can take the transpose of the adjunct, adjoint or the adjoint of the transpose, you get the same result. And this is multiplying the term, which depends on gravity and on velocity term. Then there's another matrix multiplying the generalized momentum. Then there's the same uh, adjoint of the transpose matrix multiplying the input u. Then there's a, 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 a function of uh, S2 uh, multiplied by the linked length L1 and L2 times the measurement vector, this is a two-dimensional vector Fm, so the two measure in the x and y direction of the local frame of the force force sensor, and then k times uh, a difference between a generalized momentum multiplied by this uh, adjoint of the transpose and the actual residual state. And then uh, we can, in fact, give an interpretation to the single term uh, the first one uh, in red is in fact gravity minus a strange uh, term which reminds of the 
colorless and centrifugal term, but has a transpose in place and a, mi a minus sign. So this is very important. We will see later on why is that, but let's take this uh, equation for granted for the time being. Then the second matrix, which is pre-multiplying the generalized momentum and the robot inertia in front of it, is nothing else than the time derivative of the Jacobian adjoint transpose or the transpose Jacobian adjoint, whatever. Okay, and it takes uh, this expression as you can see here. Um, the factor function multiplying Fm, the measured force, so the nominal, what you're really getting as a measure, which in fact is not relieving the total contact force, is pre-multiplied by nothing else than the determinant of the Jacobian or of the Jacobian transpose, which is exactly the same. And finally, K multiplies, uh, in fact, what we call an, the output of this residual generator, and I call this output as R. Now, why, how did I uh, write down this long equation is kind of complex to explain now, and it requires uh, some more development, but the principle is always the same. We are monitoring not the generalized momentum as such, but something related to the generalized momentum, in fact, pre-multiplied by J transpose. It should be J to the minus transpose, but in fact, because of singularities, uh, we prefer to use the adjoint here. Now, uh, when we have a, a, fault, a, a, a fault on the sensor, so this F sub F, which is a two-dimensional vector, so it could be have uh, uh, fault on the x direction and on the uh, component strain gauge measuring forces in that direction or uh, in the um, components measuring force in the y direction or concurrent at both sides. Then we use this residual generator which as you can see is a function of the state of the robot as that we assume to be available is a function of the measured Forced by our faulty, possibly faulty sensor, and of course is a measure, is a function also of the state of the residual, which is accessible to us by construction. Now, the evolution of the output of the residual is the one shown in the red box, which is minus kr, and then modulated by uh, the determinant of the Jacobian, so L1, L2, sine of Q2 does the presence of the fault. So, the residual is sensitive to the fault, so we can do detection, because we start with an R which is zero, and it will remain zero as long as F sub F is zero, but as soon as this is uh, different from zero, modulated by uh, sine of Q2, it will, reflect, it will uh, react. Now, remember that uh, L1, L2 sine of Q2 is modulating both components of F of F, but not mixing components. So, not only we have detection, using the diagonal K, we will have also isolation in this case. The only thing that we don't have is a fully linear dynamics for our residual. Okay? So, this is uh, decoupled and uh, modulated by Q2. And I would leave as an exercise to prove that this expression, which is the analysis of how will this residual signal, which is a two-dimensional vector again, evolve over time, uh, that to prove that this expression is in fact correct. To prove it, you have to take the expression of R, make the derivative uh, with respect to time, use the dynamics of zeta, so z dot, do the all the substitution and find out that this is in fact what you expect. Now this is a slightly different, there's no K in front of the, of the uh, fold, like in the case of actuation fold, you could bring the K there if you wish, but in fact you don't really care much about this, because you have anyway this uh, nonlinear function in front of the fold. Act. So the identification of the fold uh, is made more complex, the identification, so knowing the profile of the fault, is slightly more complex because we have a function in front of it which goes to zero 
when uh, the robot crosses a singularity. So in that case, you're not able to uh, detect anything. And if you're standing still in a singularity, then uh, the residual will not feel uh, any force because of this, any, any uh, faulty measurement. Okay, so uh, let's see uh, this in simulation, uh, a simple simulation right now. So um, we have a, a, a bias fault acting uh, in two intervals. So these is our, are the fault on the X and Y component of the force torque sensor. There's a concurrency for some times. And you can see that the residual uh, are decoupled. So they are zero when uh, there's no fault in, on the signals that they are monitoring and they become different from zero, but um, oscillating in this case, um, when the fault is present. And they don't interact with each other. Uh, here uh, I use a, a diagonal K with zero one values on the diagonals. And to understand why we get the sinusoidal, we should know that the robot was controlled in this case by a computer torque method, and it was tracking uh, a sinusoid in Q2. So if Q2 is uh, moving as a sinusoid with a certain amplitude, which is pi over 8, and a certain frequency, 0 0.1 radian per second, now you can recognize that what you get is exactly the expression that you expect. In fact, in particular, for, let's say, the fault on uh, the Fx component, which is 0 0.3 Newton. Now, uh, if you look at the peak of this blue sinusoid, uh, and you multiply 0 0.3 by the amplitude of the Q2, uh, we, had used, we were using unitary link length in this case, so uh, the amplitude is pi over 8 multiplied by 0 0.3, so you have more or less uh, 10 over 8, uh, slightly less than 10 over 8. Uh, so, um, sorry, uh, 1 over 8, in fact. So almost uh, 0 0.1 uh, Newton. Uh, and this is, in fact, the peak value of the blue oscillating curve. Uh, you will see a, a small negative oscillation first. So there's a small transient, and the transient, the duration of the transient in the response is modulated by the K, in fact. And similarly for the other one, where you can see that uh, this was a larger value, it's 0 0.6 Newton, uh, still modulated by the sine of Q2 uh, with a peak of uh, pi over 8. So here you have a, a larger value being reached and a longer transient because the value is larger because you're using the same K. And if you do the computation, you understand that this makes sense. So you have, again, uh, detection and isolation and with or without concurrency of faults. And we have done also an experiment on the Pendulbot, which had no force sensor and, in fact, no contact. So, in fact, uh, we are not measuring anything. So, again, we are trying to emulate the situation with this simple um, experimental device. Uh, let me sign something here. Uh, so, and this, uh, you can see here the evolution of the joint position. In particular, uh, the second joint, which has uh, a red uh, dashed profile, is crossing Q2 over 0, so it's crossing a singularity. And this is uh, the residual that emulates bias measurement faults, uh, minus 1 uh, Newton on uh, Fx, and 0 0.05 Newton on Fy. Uh, there's a warning uh, here. Um, in this experiment, we made a slight change with respect to the previous formula. So wherever you find the adjunct of the transpose, uh, we have replaced this with uh, a matrix which is diagonal multiply the inverse of the transpose. But uh, if you look carefully, uh, the diagonal uh, has uh, 
sine of q2 on the first element and 1 on the second element. So in fact we are removing uh, at the denominator of the inverse of the transpose uh, the sine of q2 wherever this would cause uh, uh, an infinite value going to 0. Okay. So we are, uh, in this sense, the second residual is the exit one, this is uh, insensitive to, uh, to a configuration, so it's like the case of the actuator. And in fact, you can see that in the period where uh, Fy uh, is uh, faulty, so in fact, is we are giving a, a measurement, well, there's no contact at all, so this is the way in which this experiment was organized. And in fact, this measurement is completely false. And we are, uh, with the red plot on the residual uh, trace, uh, we, we see that uh, the residual goes to minus 0 0.05. And similarly, uh, to understand the behavior of the blue plus, which is below threshold and then uh, recognized threshold above, there's no dynamic uh, filtering in this case, but indeed it could be done. Uh, you see that this is similar, instead of being constant, it's modulated by sine of Q2, in fact. And uh, if you look at the blue plots of the joint position, you see that you recognize the evolution of Q2 uh, in a similar way. Uh, and even when you're getting closer, closing to the uh, um, you're getting closer to the, uh, sorry, the, Q, the Q2 is the red plots, uh, but you see the uh, sinusoidal behavior. When you're getting to the closer to the singularity zone, what happens is that you will uh, not follow the presence of the fault, but anyway, when this happens, you're already within the threshold, so you're just crossing the singularity without no uh, complication. Okay. Uh, what happens if we are considering non-concurrent faults? So, for instance, uh, if we would like uh, to detect both the faults of the actuators and the faults of the force sensor component and assume that they may be concurrent, they may be concurrent uh, in pairs, in triples, whatever. Well, uh, if we, this is our goal, then we cannot achieve both detection and isolation. There's a fundamental uh, theoretical results which prevents, which bars from achieving FDI in these cases. In fact, if uh, one can show that if you have a mechanical system, in particular a robot, with n degrees of freedom, so with n generalized coordinates, then the maximum number of faults that, that you can detect and isolate under the possible concurrency is equal to n. So if we have a, our 2R robot and we are considering uh, actuator faults, there are two faults there, and if we are considering uh, faults of the forced or sensor mountain and the factor like we did just in the previous slide, there are two more, so there's a total of four which exceeds the number of degrees of freedom, which is two, so this result said that we cannot design a, a detector and, and isolate. However, if we uh, assume non-concurrency, and in fact we are considering these four faults for our 2R robot, and we are using exactly the same residual that we did, uh, we used four uh, actuator faults, and this will be the residual R11 and R12, and four uh, sensor faults of the fourth or sensor, and this will be the residual R21 and R22, then we have this following table of dependence. So when we have, for instance, a fault on actuator 1, then the residual R11 will be affected. The residual R12, no, because we know that locally this is a FDI system for uh, actuator faults, but also the two residual that we design for the four-star sensor fault will be affected as well. So there's no perfect decoupling. Similarly, if we do the same analysis for the second actuator fault, uh, 
then the residual, the second uh, residual of the actuator type will be affected, not the first one, but also the other two will be affected. And similarly, for the four sensor folds, you will see that locally there's a uh, identity, two by two identity matrix relating these two four folds with the uh, second set of residual, but the actuator residual folds, the, uh, sorry, the residual for the actuator folds will all be affected as well. So if we had achieved FDI in this case, we would have such dependence as a diagonal matrix. In fact, this is not longer true. So if we don't know if they are concurrent or not, we cannot achieve FDI in this case. However, under the assumption that you can have at least, at most, one fault at a time, then it is clear that you can, uh, looking at the combination of these four continuous signals and reasoning about logic, you can build an isolation logic. So, if you have a, a force, uh, a, a, an actuator fold at joint one, so F U one, as I use these uh, tiny letters, then you will see that uh, you have to build a, a logic that takes the uh, non-zero nature of three out of four of the residual, and this will isolate uh, the uh, actuator fold at joint one. Similarly, for all the other four, three cases, the non-available means that this situation occurs only if you have concurrency, and in fact you're excluding concurrency. And finally, the 0, 0, 0, when all the residuals are uh, not affected, uh, this will be associated to no fault at all. So, uh, we made a, a simulation in this case, and we assume a time sequence of all these faults, we consider bias faults, just for simplicity, uh, but they are never concurrent. And first there's an actuator, uh, actuator fault at actuator 1, then at actuator 2, then a fault on the X component of the 4-star sensor, and finally a fault on the Y component. And so this is the sequence of faults, all of bias type, of different amplitude, but this is not important now. And this is the evolution of the residual. As you can see, uh, on top you have the two residuals that we designed for actuator faults. At the bottom we have the two residuals that we designed uh, for the um, forced or sensor faults. And when the uh, fault occurs on actuator 1, you will see on the top uh, graph that the blue residual is uh, being affected, the red residual not, because it's associated one-to-one -one, uh, locally to a, a, a fault of actuator 2, but on the other side you see that both, uh, both residual that we designed for fault of the four-star sensor are being affected as well. So this means that you have no isolation. And if you look carefully into the evolution of these plots, you recognize exactly the same situation of dependence that we have in the first table. Now, based on the isolation matrix, and this is a general terminology, in fact, we can do the following isolation logic. So, on the left-hand side, you have continuous time signals that pass through end ports, which are logic ports, in which the inputs are either uh, as they are being generated or they are negated. Huh? When well, you see uh, a black dot, this means that this signal is being negated. So only if, if and only if, all signals, direct or negated, in the inputs are present, then the end generates an output signal, which is a validation. And then you pick one of the residual, you multiply by this validation signal, and you have the final uh, residual that allows you to isolate, not only detect, uh, each of these four uh, folds, more than the number of generalized coordinates of this robot, under the assumption of non-concurrency. In fact, 
if you do this follow and for instance let's let's see one of these uh, end ports for instance the second one the second one will generate uh, a signal which is non-zero if and only if the fault is on the second actuator so it takes the second component of the uh, first class of residual the one that we designed exactly for the, this purpose but is activated by one as an output to uh, this end port only if there are the three signals uh, R12, R21 and R22 the continuous signals and the first signal R11 is zero which is exactly the first row of our dependence and also in the isolation matrix if we look at uh, the fault Fe1 you will see that this is being isolated when you have uh, the um, sorry for Fe2 we are talking when you have uh, residual R21 and R22 active uh, residual R12 active but a zero value for the residual 1, 1. Of course, you may complement this with threshold, with dynamic filtering, and so on. But in this simulation, this is the hybrid residual that allows isolation of all four folds. In fact, you see that these outputs are one, are different from zero, if and only if the associated fold is being is occurring. Okay, uh, this slide very quick uh, describe instead how to use the same monitoring of generalized momentum uh, for doing uh, friction compensation. These are experimental results gathered uh, in a collaboration with DLR where they had a 7R medical robot, so lightweight, with harmonic drives and very large reduction ratio with a lot of friction at the joints. And the model is an elastic joint dynamic model, so we have to use this fact uh, in the constructing the um, dynamic equation and of course the generalized momentum that we are interested in. Now, uh, if we do this uh, estimation via the residual, you can see that the blue line is no estimation at all, while the red line shows the evolution of friction while the robot is moving. Okay, is moving under whatever control action. So you see that uh, the evolution of these friction terms is random, I would say. In fact, we are not using any model. We are not assuming that this is a viscous friction, a static friction, a Coulomb friction, whatever. We are just having a signal which is a filtered version of the actual friction acting on the system. Uh, indeed, we assume that we know uh, all other relevant parameters needed not many in this case because we are working on the motor side so we know the uh, joint torque uh, we know the stiffness of the joint we know the inertia of the motor but that's about it now this is just the estimate if you design a suitable control law we don't care which control law you are using but you can see that when we are adding to the command coming from the tracking controller uh, this term which eliminates the presence of friction I mean the estimate of the uh, present friction then you see that there's a large improvement in the position error if you compare for the seven joints there are seven plots in fact here uh, what happens without the friction observer and so without the friction observer used as a compensation you see that the blue plots uh, are away from zero uh, much more than the red plots and in particular for joint 6 and 7 you see that there's a residual error being there uh, because of the unmodeled and uncompensated friction while compensating it through the residual will keep the error practically at zero the position error practically at zero so there's a, a big improvement and a uh, believe me, when uh, you feel the motion of the arm uh, without friction compensation, it's very hard to move this arm by hand, which is what required by a medical doctor uh, having this lightweight robot assisting him or her uh, doing surgery. 
while if you compensate error, no matter if you're controlling the trajectory or just keeping the robot uh, floating uh, under gravity compensation, then you can push and move around the robot by hand in a very simple way. And this is thanks to the compensation of friction. Uh, finally, uh, this is the last slide, and then we will have the uh, bibliographic uh, references. Uh, there are many more techniques. In fact, I've presented mainly what we have developed for research as being this, being this uh, a research seminar, in a sense. Um, so, uh, you can combine many sensors, multiple sensors, micro, camera, uh, vibration, sensor, accelerometer, position measurement, and so on. So many signal-based inputs, and also many model-based inputs like the residual that we have generated monitoring the generalized momentum. And so the model-based are typically exact in the sense that if we have an accurate model, we know what to expect. The signal-based one should be elaborated in a more approximate way because uh, they have a, a, some signature of the fault. This is the correct term being used, but we really don't know exactly uh, what they are generating. So just that they are excited by some uh, faults. Now, if you put everything together in a big uh, generator of uh, <laughs> let's call them residual, you may try to attempt best of the, the best of both worlds, so the model-based and the signal-based one. So, for instance, uh, here uh, you generate residual uh, from signal signal, and you have a class of signal-based, a class of model-based, with sub-models, and you, know, you can include the model of the actuators, you model uh, the joint elasticity, the rigid robot, and so on in our case, and uh, on the signal base you may take numerical differentiation, fast Fourier transform of your signal, wavelet transformation of your uh, any kind of signal, uh, thresholding, and so on. Now all these residual are being passed through uh, a, an intelligence system that in this case was a neurofuzzy module for each set, and finally, you can generate uh, classification and isolation and identification signal through this process. So, for instance, here uh, in the Safari project, uh, we developed uh, uh, using joint position, commanded torque, uh, using a microphone, uh, a microphone that is associated to the fact that you uh, have a collision and you, and you uh, listen to the impact or uh, you have uh, the motor producing a, a noise because of its failure, then uh, through processing, through signal-based and model-based, in particular generalized momenta, uh, you can have signals that allow you detection and isolation. So, uh, we came to an end. Here, there's a list of papers that you may be interested in. The first one is the Parasini paper uh, from which I've taken the first uh, graphs from the first few slides, then there's a long work done by a former PhD, uh, Faila Mattone, uh, the work done with DLR on Friction Observer, and we stopped doing uh, work in this, concept, in this context for actuator or sensor faults for a while, and we recovered now with a recent paper that we submitted to a, a conference in South Korea in December, uh, which does uh, detection and isolation of actuator faults and of also of collision, which is our next topic, when we are dealing with a, a robot arm that has a, a flexible link, so distributed flexibility, not concentrated with the job. And uh, we came to an end. Thank you for listening to this long lecture. Bye-bye.